studying medicine initially in particular. Um, so I will hand you guys over to Richard. Um, take it away, one of you ready. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks a million guys. Um, so first a little bit about me. Um, I am in my final year as an SHO going into registrar level in about a week's time after finishing the BST. I started in Pavia in 2012 um, and finished there in 20, 2013. I started finishing in 2019. Um, after five and a half years and then joined and did my internship in Limerick in Ireland. Following that I did um, my BST and um, basic specialist training and that basically allows you to become and um, gives you the right to uh, apply for specialization and during that time I did my MRCP exams which is the membership exams which they have the equivalent in England to as well. So essentially the main points which I wanted to know um, when I was finishing up, which there was very little information on when I was doing it, so it's great this is happening, um, is how to get an internship in Ireland. Um, so in Ireland, in your medical degree to become a fully licensed doctor in Ireland and England, you have to have your degree and then your certificate of experience. Okay, With those two combined, you're a fully qualified doctor. In Italy, it's your three months now, as far as I remember. When it was me, it was the Esame di Stato, and that was it, and you're fully qualified. Um, but um, in Ireland, you have to have your medical degree and your um, certificate of experience. Your certificate of experience is your internship in Ireland or FY1 or FY2 in England. Um, now, when I graduated um, in March of 2019, we, I had applied to both England and Ireland, got a place in both, and subsequently decided to go to Ireland. For a number of reasons um but that was a challenge in itself so you finish your medical degree your points don't matter at the end you don't have to get 110 after 110 um like we all seem to feel like we have to um and then what you do then is you apply apply through the internship um panel and the hse if you just type in internship ireland hse uh, doctors you'll see it the inter the applications open fairly um early so I'd be starting to look at the start of the academic year to ensure that you are up to date with it. Once you apply to that and you meet the criteria, you proceed to step two, which is, if it still it is, is when, when I did it, is the intern employment eligibility test. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, is that still a thing? Um, yeah, so there's two parts. Um, the first part is a written-based exam and the second part is an OSCE-based exam. And once you finish that, you have to also do your IELTS exam. So even though I finished and graduated in uh, and did all my school in English, I did my final exams in English, I did two years of university in English, but and I did my Italian medical degree, my medical degree in Italian in English, you still have to do the IELTS. Now, Ireland requires you to get an average of eight or more. England requires a 7.5 or more. <clears throat> now, the important thing with the intern employment eligibility test is it's not um, you'll definitely pass it. I've met a few people who didn't pass it. You do need to study for it. Um, and I can pass on all the questions that I've got through the years, but I'm sure it's gone through. I sent it about four years ago. Uh, all the people who I know applied um, got it. Um, and then once you get your um, approval for passing that test, you can go to step three. Step three then is you can actually apply to be an intern. And there's approximately 560 places every year as in intern spots in Ireland. Um, and there's approximately 800 Irish graduates every year. So there's actually less intern spots and more medical students in Ireland. Now, the important thing to consider then is which tier you're in. So depending on which tier you're in depends on what your um, likelihood of getting the intern test, the intern years. So if you're an Irish medical graduate um, and you're Irish nationality, you're first tier, so you get first preference. If you're European and um, in the EU and you're an Irish medical graduate, you get second tier. If you're Irish or from the EU and you've studied in Europe, you get third tier. Um, and then if you're non-EU, you get last tier. Uh, so that's important for anyone considering who's not from the EU and not from Ireland. Despite you having a European medical degree, you're at the bottom of the list when it comes to intern year, unlike uh, England, um, which would be advantageous for those applying there. Now, 
when you apply, if you're European and you pass the intern test, you will get a spot in Ireland. Those 800 graduates are half of them are from North America and um, Saudi Arabia the, um, and and um, countries like that. So they get actually put at the bottom of the list. So unfortunately, a lot of them don't get it. But if you're a European graduate and you're Irish, you will get ahead of them. Um, it's just the way it is. I, I don't know why it's like that. Um, it's an awful system in some ways, but um, that's the information anyway. So once you do get approval and you've passed the two tests and you've passed the English test and you've passed stage three, you'll be asked to rank your intern spots. Now, I think when I did it, there was a 50% pass rate on all those. And um, so you'd one in two chance of not getting it. Um, I, I don't remember the statistics now. But at the time when I applied, it was 45% pass to both exams. And um, so it's important to study for that um, if you do intend to do it. Um, and I've met two Irish people who have made it to intern year and two people have failed the IELTS and had to redo it twice. And um, so even if you're a fluent English speaker, you, you have to uh, study for that too. So it's a, it's a bit more of a process. Then um, once you do that, you rank your intern spots. And then in July 9th, um, every year, second year of July, you'll be starting your internship. Now, the important thing with that is with your Italian medical degree. When I finished in 2019, they had the Esame di Stato, which was different to um, the um, degree itself. Now, I know a fella who was here two years ago who graduated when they amalgamated both of them and made your internship part of the three years. My dean at the time was Esposito. I'm, I'm sure he's still there, the renal consultant there. Um, he was the dean of medicine with us. Um, and he, what we did with him was we discussed it with him. Would it be possible to separate the two? Um, because if you do those three months, you are no longer eligible to apply um, for... Um, for internship in Ireland or England. Now, would there's a lot of trouble you might think to do intern year or do FY1, FY2. Now, if you're finishing in Italy, you have never done an OSCE, you've never really um, spent a lot of time doing intern jobs and being actually in the UK and Irish system, which works very different to the Italian system. I would highly, highly, highly recommend you do intern year in Ireland or FY1, FY2. It gives you a really, really good base in order to progress. I've met a new number of colleagues who've come from Italy and gone to Ireland or England, and it's and they didn't do the intern year. They went straight in. They did the exam with the stat or the three months, and it's been a, a steep, steep learning curve. And um, you don't learn the basics of how the system works. Of a simple task to IV cannulate to reviewing sick patients in a certain way to different things like that that it is very important you do it because without that when you're an SHO um, in England or Ireland you will be expected to know how to do those things now if you don't get it it's not the end of the world and um, I know plenty of people have done it it's just a bit more scary um, and once you're finished that in Ireland there you have to finish your intern year then um, there's mainly five options. You can go down the emergency medicine route, the obs and gynae route, the peds route, uh, surgery or medicine. What I'm doing is internal medicine. So what you do then is after you finish your basics or GP, so six, um, what you do then when you finish your intern year, every, everyone will finish their intern year. It's not really a question. Um, you apply to, for my case, the basic specialist training scheme. So on that basic specialist training scheme, you're have to do two years of rotations around the country, six months peripheral and um, 18 months in your certain hub. So I'm in Dublin um, and I've finished in Beaumont. Um, for, I've been in Beaumont for 18 months. Within those two years, you're expected to do these big exams, three big exams, which also have a 50% fail rate in every time. Um, they're called the MRCPs. The surgical ones have their own ones. Ops and gynae have their own ones. Um, and pediatrics have their own ones um, and once you finish them you, there's three of them they take about a year to do on top of your clinical work on top of everything else on top of doing audits and um, on top of uh, doing research and presenting at conferences which is integral as well which all contribute points to your schemes and um, you become a member of your the Royal College of Physicians Ireland which is what I'm a member of or the Royal College of Surgeons Royal College of Obstetricians then once you're finished that, which is the stage I'm at, um, which I'll be at in a week, 
um, you become registrar. So registrars kind of run the hospital at night um, and on on-call shifts. And only once you're finished the BST or your surgical specialist training or your ob specialist training, and you're a member of those respective colleges, do you have the right to apply for specialization? You might not get it. Um, so again, it's very different to Italy where you do the big state exam and you do the big multiple choice question exams. Um, and then you get into specialization in Ireland and England. It's about when you finish medical school, about three to four years till you actually get given the right to apply to specialize. So I myself, I want to do gastro. Um, I'm pretty determined to do it. Done a good bit of research in it on top of the exams, but I'm actually taking six months off to travel. So um, I won't be applying for that yet. Um, so that's kind of everything in a nutshell. There are some nuances. What I'd really recommend you to do, and I'm sure you guys have done it, uh, is talk to the dean of the medicine in each in each of your respective universities and tell them what you want to do. At this stage, they should all know about Irish graduates or people going to England. It's really common um, to do so, or Germany or Switzerland or Israel, um, wherever. They should be very familiar, your dean, with it. That's the best bit of advice. And also to look up the dates for the internships. In England and Ireland, if you miss the cutoff, you're gone. Um, and it's it's a it's quite a short period, um, so that's basically everything um, to 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 go on with intern year. And um, does anyone have any questions or anything like that that I can address? Yeah, so guys, right now we'll leave um, the the way for any questions, um, any specific queries about anything that Richard has said. Um, feel free to also write in the chat if you. Prefer. Or forever hold your peace. <laughs> and just for while while we're waiting for questions, um, I killed myself to get a uh, 110, 110, which um is very important in Italy when I was doing it. It's not important in Ireland or England. Not 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 as important as long as you get over 100, 105. That's enough. And um, you'll also, because in Italy you do a master's degree. At the end, I did mine in um, in uh, nutrition with Prof. Prof. Chenna. Um, uh, you get an increase in pay, so that's also great. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, because I've personally heard that from a lot of students where um, they're, they're very grades focused, but um, I, I think you, you might have mentioned as well the way that the rankings work yeah. uh, for the internship. It's on the basis of, um, I suppose, more so when you graduate, like if you graduate on time as opposed to... Yeah, exactly. Graduate. Like it, it helps, like it helps. Like I, I graduated with 110 and I didn't get like 110 versus cum laude, doesn't matter. Yeah. you've got a first you've got a first in Ireland that's yeah. the highest you can get they don't really care um but coming from uh Italy if you graduate uh, on time firstly that's very important you, um I would even what what I did because I was so worried about it because I was the first one that I know of that went to Ireland I never met anyone that went to Ireland from Italy I met a bunch of people that went from Poland Okay. Um, and a bunch of people went from Hungary. They went straight to uh, SHO level, but never anyone who went to the intern level. Okay. And um, it didn't matter at all. Um, all you have to do is pass. And what I did is I did my um, uh, exam because, you know, there's the six sessions every year. I yeah. asked for special permission to finish in March um, of 2019 to ensure that I had everything ready because I was a bit paranoid. Right. Um, so make sure you get all that. And with your... Um, thesis is pick something easy don't be doing something complicated um, and it's, it's not worth it um, I've met lots of people who picked an overly complicated thing and graduated a year and a half later and okay. for what you want to be a doctor you don't want to do research um, but also while you're in Italy travel lots I'm glad I traveled so much and um, it was the best six yeah. years ever and you look <laughs> back on it fondly um, Good. So. any questions lads Oh, and enjoy the food because oh, pizza is hear me? in Ireland. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can. Hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I have a question um, concerning Ireland. If I graduate from Italy, do I need to do the one-year internship in Ireland or no? I'm sorry if you covered this topic. No, no, you're all right. Um, so you have to do. What year are you in? 
I'm in the fifth year now. Fifth year. So you'd be thinking about it now. So you have to think, do you want to do the intern year in Ireland or do you not want to do the intern year in Ireland? The quickest way for you to start working is to finish your exams and do the three months internship in Italy. And then you can work straight away as an SHO level in Ireland or England. What I would recommend, though, is you finish, is you start looking now for your internship applications. You do not do the three months because with that, you are ineligible to apply for um, your internship and then do your do your um, thesis, apply for your internship and then do your internship in Ireland. It's not necessary to do an internship in Ireland in order to work in Ireland, though. You can finish your medical degree and your three months in Italy and then work in Ireland. That's also fine. Okay, thank you. Now, um, concerning the three months that you mentioned, these are separate from our uh, degree that we're studying for. Is it something extra I do after graduation? Yeah, so as you guys might be able to shine a bit. At, like when I finished my um, degree, it was in order to fully qualify, um, you have to do your certificate of experiences, which is your internship in Ireland, your FY1, FY2 in England, or in my time, it was the Esame di Stato. Um, which is the state exam now as far as I know it's changed three months um yeah so like um from my knowledge anyway what it is now is um the three months internship are called the Tirocini Abilitante oh, and okay. um, so, yeah so there's three of them I think um it's one is surgery one is a medicine based one and I think one is a general practitioner or family doctor um and those can be done um, granted, you have all of the exams done um, from first to fourth year, you can begin those Tirocini Abilitante in fifth year. Um, or, and of course, you can do them all in, in sixth year as well, or for the corso or whoever. Um, but I think that's how it is now. You do these uh, Tirocini Abilitante and that's your internship. Um, yeah. yeah. And without them, you're not a fully qualified doctor in Italy. So exactly. Yeah. You have to do yeah, so. We cannot graduate without doing the ability. No, you, you can graduate, but mm. your graduation is only one part of being a doctor. Having a medical degree is only part of it. And you have to do those three months, the Tirocino Abilitante, or you have to do your internship in Ireland, or you have to What do you mean? This, yeah, so this is like um, uh, a whole other topic, but um, basically it's it's really dependent on your dean. So there are some um, universities, so at the moment in Italian. Go ahead. Um, so at, at the moment, in, in terms of Italian legislation, it's legally integrated into the degree that we have to do these Cilicini Abilitante. However, depending on the dean that you have, if you discuss with them, uh, you know, this is what's required for doing uh, internships in Ireland, um, foundation year in UK, whatever, um, some university deans have allowed since the integration of this new legislation, they have allowed students to graduate what's called non abilitante, so um, without doing these tirocini. Or um, I have known as well of students that have done these tirocini, but they have written on their transcript that it's still non abilitante. Um, so it is a bit kind it's of. Grey area. It is a bit of a grey area. It is possible, um, it, depending on the university. It's it's something we're kind of still looking into for uh, UNITO specifically, so at Torino. Um, but I suppose that's kind of the process of, you know, doing these conferences, finding out the, this kind of information. What are the requirements? And then when we know what requirements are needed, then we can go ask deans, we can go ask for information and requests, etc. So, so, yeah if that answers your question. It's kind of a gray area, sorry, it's not really a yes yeah, or no. Yeah. It, it it's university of... independent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, wherever you are, you'll have to ask your dean. Um, I yeah. know Pavia, there was a year where they definitely did it. Uh, I suppose mm. there was very good to us. Um, and when it was my time, it, it, there was no separation. This is something that was brought in fairly recently, I think three years ago or so. Um, mm. And even three years ago, I heard about someone coming in non abilitante. Okay. Um, so it is possible, but you have to talk to your dean. It's as simple as that. I won't be able to give you that answer. Yeah. Um, and just on, on that note, I, I do believe Sarah might touch on that. So our, our second speaker of today, um, she has looked into this, um, as far as I know, quite a bit herself. So um, it might be a possibility in, in Sapienza 
Um, but it is unfortunately something we don't have the information on yet for Tolino specifically, but um, we will inform students if if it's ever discovered. We'll see. Um, I have an additional question, please. I just read for Ireland that they require a 12 month internship. Um, and they have a very specific pattern of internships, so three months in some uh, uh, specialities, another three months in other specialities. So in Italy, the abilitante is only three months. Does yeah, so Ireland accept that? Yes. It, they accept it, but you will not go in as an intern. You will go in as a senior house officer. Okay, so this position as senior head officer, um, it's not considered as a residency? No. Uh, no. Yeah. No, it's very different in Ireland and and the UK. In order to specialize, you have to do um, it's it's very different. Um, your pathway is completely separate. So, um, unlike residency in America, which is um, or I'm not sure about Canada, which is four years. Once you apply and you get your spot, um, you're a consultant in Ireland. It's you have to do your basic specialist scheme, become a member of your respective um, field. So I'm a member of the Royal College of Physicians and I've finished the basic specialist training in internal medicine. Only once you've finished those two years and done all the exams, do you have the right to apply for our equivalent of residency? And um, so only now do I have the right to apply to uh, gastroenterology. And um, so I, if you come straight from Italy, and you haven't done any of these things, you will not be able to apply for our equivalent of residency. Thank you. No other. It's a bit of a longer road in Ireland and England, but the experience really does help. Um, uh, but it's up to you. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions on the YouTube live. Um, No. Okay. Um, if that's all, um, oh, sorry, there are some questions in the YouTube live. I'll just read them out. Um, so, um, from Parsa, um, he had a question regarding a deadline for applying for Ireland. Um, and usually, how long does it take um, to get a response if you get in or not? Um, and this is um, coming from a non EU student. Okay. Um, so what I would do is the I would look up the HSC website. It changes every year and um, I am just looking it up now. So you need to have graduated on or after the 1st of April every year, it says here. Um, and you can apply. You need the IELTS. You need guard vetting. You need your basic life support, which you'll have to do. And um, if I will send I'll send the the um the link which has all the information to to the lads here and they can put it in um I'll just send it here and all the information is there it changes every year it's by a few days so I don't want to give you a certain timeline but if you're non-eu um it, it, the, everyone finds out the same time and everyone has the same deadline there's no difference between eu or non-eu Okay, perfect. Um, and just uh, following on from that, um, uh, are there any criteria as well on the basis um, besides the entrance exam um, for getting into the internship? So are there interviews? Is there a CV required? Yeah, okay. So so there is a few things. You have to be, um, if you're non-EU, you have to have your stamp four. Um, you have to get Garda vetting in, or sorry, you have to get your police clearance in Italy, which takes like a day. It's one of the few quick things that happens in the bureaucracy there. Okay. Um, you have to do your IELTS exam, so your international English language tests, which you have to, oh, they changed it. I just, they, they changed it. You need a seven uh, average now. Um, you have to do your, importantly, you have to do your basic life support training, um, which is your BLS. That's fairly easy. Um, that has to be done in English, as far as I remember, as well. And your intern employment eligibility test is two parts. The first part is generally held in, held in January. The second part is generally held in February. And it's knowledge of the Irish uh, system, healthcare system, public health and safety issues and prescribing practices. 
So there's a few things. I've sent the link in, which the guys will send you around. There's a few things that you have to do. So you really got to be organized with this stuff. Um, and there's a lot of deadlines and a lot of stuff you have to get done. If you're in fifth year, this I used summer holidays in fifth year to get all these bits done. Um, because if you don't have your English test, by the time you apply, you're, you're not eligible. So there's no messing around with this sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But all the requirements I've sent, I've sent a copy on WhatsApp to the guys, so they'll they'll, they'll put it up there, and um, that has everything you need um, on it. Perfect. Um, and I think just one last question from the YouTube live. Um, someone's just asking, is the internship paid? Yes. Yeah. 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 Paid well. <laughs> um, yeah. In Ireland, we get paid. We we get. I think is it still thirteen hundred euro scholarship a month or something crap in Italy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so in Ireland, my brother just started his intern year. When I did it, um, it is so your 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 contract is thirty nine hours a week. Um, I think I've never worked thirty nine hours a week in my life. I, I'm just finished. I'm just finishing up eight days in a row here. Um, but it is, um, thirty nine hours a week minimum is is your is your base pay. Your base pay per year as an intern is thirty eight thousand euro a year which works out to be around 1300 a fortnight. Um, so it's double at least, and you never work 39 hours. So in Ireland, um, you're 39, say you work 40 hours, that extra hour is time and a half. So you, you earn a really good wage, to be honest, especially for your first year as working. Um, so yeah, it's definitely paid. It's better paid than England too, cool. by quite a bit. Cool, good to know, good to know. All right. Um, yeah, so I think if no one else has any questions, um, and as well, um, we will send any resources um, that the speaker sent on to us um, to you guys, students as well. Um, but if that's everything, we can move on um, maybe to Sarah, if she's ready. I just hold on a moment. Uh, I have a small question for Richard uh, okay. from YouTube. Um, someone's asking regarding uh, the IELTS. Um, it's more of an IELTS related uh, question. Uh, what if the IELTS was done maybe in fifth year? Um, for example, yeah. you don't do you have to do it right before the application, or oh, yeah, can it question. be done so, in advance? Yeah, it lasts two years, so you have uh, two years between when to apply. And so, if you so intern year starts in July of, uh, say you're doing it next year, or say you have your intern year that's coming up, you can do two years beforehand. So, if I applied for this year's intern year, which is July twenty three, if I did my um, IELTS after um, July 2021, you're, you're fine. It's the same with the BLS. The BLS lasts two years as well. So as long as you have it between those two, you're fine. Okay, perfect. And uh, one last thing. Um, are there like, available sources to study for the internship exam if uh, someone would yeah. like to go online? Yeah, there is. It's, it's all on the website that, um, uh, that I linked in there. Now, if there is people who progress far enough, uh, I can link them in with um, other people who have done their exam recently, only if you've applied and intend to sit the exam because, or else I, I end up getting a lot of emails of the questions and the typical questions we've got. But if you look on the, um, the link that I've sent in, they have a lot of sample questions of, of, of what you need to do. Okay, perfect, thank All you. Right. Okay. Okay. Happy um, enough, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so, um, if that's it, if there's no more questions for Richard, um, also if anyone kind of jumps in and has any extra questions, um, there will be uh, another Q and A section after um Sarah's presentation. So feel free to ask away there. Um, but yeah, for now we can move on to Sarah. Um, so, as I said before, Sarah is um, she's a medical student um, currently studying in La Sapienza in Rome. Um, and yeah, take it away, Sarah, whenever you're ready. Sure. So uh, I prepared a very quick uh, presentation. Uh, it's very, very bare bones, but I was hoping that we can quickly fly through it. And then I wanted to leave more time for a discussion. And at the end, I can clarify some things about TPVS because I had to run in and out of the room, so I didn't catch all of the discussion, but um, I can talk a bit about that at the end. So uh, can you guys see everything? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so essentially, I kind of wish I had thought about 
uh, the after part of medical school a lot earlier. Uh, now that I'm in sixth year and I'm almost done, I'm really, really panicking because I didn't prepare anything. I didn't know where I wanted to go. I kind of thought that getting into medical school was the hard part. So what you need to kind of consider now or what I recommend that you start thinking about is first, how many years till you finish specialization? Because if you go to the UK, best case scenario, you get everything on the first go, which it's very common to have to repeat years. It's going to take you about 10 years to become a consultant. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's fine. If you're young, that's absolutely fine. But it is something that you might want to consider. What are the pay conditions like? Um, I really don't like this concept of doing medicine because it's like a noble profession. Sure. But at the end of the day, it's a job and you deserve to be fairly compensated. So it's important for you to consider if the pay is worth it for the hours. What are the working hours like? What are the rights like in general? Because if you're going to be working 100 hours a week and then getting 1, like 1,500 a month, it is not worth uh, spending the rest of your 20s suffering. The other thing is, what will it open afterwards? Because sometimes it might be better to take a, a worse residency option if it's going to open further doors. Uh, for example, I would hate to go to the UK, but I know if I go to the UK, I can go to Australia afterwards. Otherwise, Australia would be closed to me. So it's kind of also to import, like it's important when you're deciding what's the step afterwards. And the last thing is, what specialty do you want to do? It's it's a really hard decision to make, especially early on. But if you want a competitive specialty, the way you need to go about deciding the country you're going to go to completely changes versus if you just want to be a GP, you just want to have like a super chill life. That gives you so many more options compared to if you want something like neurosurgery. Um, other things that you might have to consider is, do you need to do internships in that country before you go there? For example, if you want to go to the US, there are mandatory internships you have to do. Do you need to build contacts? If you want to go to Germany, you need to build contacts because they're the people who are going to get you that job. Do you need to learn multiple languages? For example, in certain regions in Italy and Switzerland, it's not enough to just know Italian. You might also need to know German on top of it. So that's two. And you might even need to learn something else. Um, are there exams? So Richard talked about some of them. Here in Italy, we do the concorso. Uh, for the US, there's the step exams. So like how many exams do you want to do? Are you going to have the time to prepare for them? Do you have enough publications? So if you're saying in Italy, publications really, really don't matter. But again, if you want to go to the US, the more publications you have, the better you're going to seem in your interviews to be able to match. And finally, the bureaucratic process. But I feel like after spending a few years in Italy, this is uh, nothing for most of us. So this is basically a summary of what I uh, said earlier. And I think it's really important to start considering these because, for example, if I knew that I wanted to go to the US, I would have started uh, trying to find professors to help me get like publications. I would have started saving up to be able to go abroad and start doing rotations. Uh, I would have started learning languages, honestly, because it's really crazy how much uh, the language part limits you because at least for me, like speaking personally, I'm not trying to attack anyone here, but I kind of convinced myself that it would be super easy and I would learn the language in a year, but I've been Italy, in Italy for six years and I speak a fine level now. So is it realistic that if you want to go to Germany, can you really do it all in one year? So, you know, you need to start uh, realistically considering what are the steps you need to start taking. So I thought we would uh, run through some really quick scenarios for a few different countries. And then at the end, we can kind of, discuss uh, not only what's considered, but uh, like I have very small approximate knowledge on a lot of different countries. So I can't give you anything exact, but I'm hoping that maybe I can help guide you guys in a better direction. So if you want to go to Canada, uh, forget it. They don't allow anyone. You need to have a Canadian citizenship or permanent residency to be able to register with CARMS, which is essentially their board of physicians. If you have one of these two, obviously, then it's an option for you. You could go to the US because they have a, a system like an exchange system. So also, if you did your residency in Canada, you're able to switch to the US. So there are some things that might eventually allow you to be in Canada. Um, but basically, if you don't already have permanent residency or a citizenship, you can't go. And every year I talk to a student who's like, oh, no, but I heard from this person who heard from this person who did this thing. And it's just it's not possible. I'm sorry. This was my first option for years, but you can't register with CARMS unless you have a uh, citizenship. So if you want to go to the US, a very popular option, it is very, very expensive. The exam registrations alone, so this isn't counting 
uh, the fact that you have to fly there, you have to do rotations there, your accommodation there, the fact that you have to apply for every single interview and pay for it for the match, not considering any of the exam preparation, the three steps all together cost about 3,000 euro, everything aside. Uh, you have to, have to, have to do clerkships while you're there. And while you're there, you have to get letters of recommendation. Um, because the way the US system does it, they kind of combine standardized exams, which are the step exams, with uh, experience, publications, um, you know, things like that. And you have to do an interview and then you have a chance to match or not. So the US system takes a very long time. Uh, setting the step exams take a while, uh, getting your interviews done, getting your letters of recommendation. This is not like a process that you can just kind of rush together in like one year. You need to start applying in advance. Also because the step exams are absolutely huge. They're massive. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but at least in Sapienza, all of our exams are oral exams. And so sure, while we learn a lot of things in detail, like switching back to doing multiple choice exams is a difficulty you wouldn't expect. Uh, but that is a very real thing that you have to do as well. Um, as an IMG, which is what you guys would be, which is an uh, international medical graduate. As an IMG, you are at a disadvantage. Um, so if you want any sort of competitive specialty, it's going to be near impossible. Of course, nothing is impossible, but you are going to have a serious, serious uphill battle against you. And the way you want to maximize your chances of getting into something is to have relevant publications in that field, have excellent letters of recommend, um, recommendation, so LORs, and to make sure that, like, I don't know if you can present in conferences, uh, get um, posters going, you know, things like that. So you have to consider that Oh, also because step one is now pass fail, um, which also made it even harder for IMGs, because in the past you could just get an amazing step one score and that would really help with your process. But now that it's pass fail, it's heavier on publications. So <laughs> I want to go to the UK. Great, they really take anyone. It's like one of the best options because they are so desperate for doctors. Whether you're EU, non-EU, nothing matters. Uh, they will take you. I just wanna make a few notes on it. The process, which is an ethics exam, and the questions in this are absolutely the most absurd things you can imagine. Like I've seen two questions and one of them was, you're walking home drunk from a bar, being certain about it, but you would have to also do the PLAB. And then what the most important part was actually your class ranking. So at the end of fifth year, you would have to uh, apply through the dean of your university and they have a special formula that they use and they rank you. And your decile ranking, so what 10% that you're in in comparison to your class would give you a certain number of points. So once you combine the score from the SJT and the score from your ranking, you'd be able to rank what um, regions you wanted to go to in the UK and then after that you would rank the cities and then after that you would rank the order of the rotations that you had to do. You also got some bonus points if you had degrees, previous degrees, and uh, up to a certain point based on the number of publications you also got extra points. Um, so this is how it worked up until now. After now it's kind of up in the air because they're introducing something called a UK MLA which is going to be like a standardized exam so we are yet to see how it affects it. Um, how the system was, again, I uh, sorry, like not the application system, but the training process is you do two years of foundation, which is made up of six rotations in different uh, departments. You, to a degree, don't get to choose the six departments. So you get to rank your choices. So once you get, uh, I think if I remember correct, they call it a deanery, which is like a region. So once you get your region, after that, you need to rank the hospitals and you rank what um, specialties you want to do. But at the end of the day, like what determines it is your rank, uh, like your class rank and your SJT score. So if you're really, really, really low ranking, then you have no choice where you're going to go and you have no choice what rotations you're going to do. So let's say your two years goes great. You're going to start your core training, which is at least three years. And then if that goes all great and it's on your first go, you, depending on the scheme that you're in, you do about three more years of specialist training. If everything goes correct, like you don't have to do a foundation year three or you finish your three core years and you go straight into it, it takes about eight years in total to become a consultant, which is like the top of the food chain in the UK. Um, so some of the pros are that uh, it doesn't matter if you're EU or non-EU, it's English speaking and you are uh, guaranteed to get a spot, which honestly, yeah. 
The cons are the NHS is currently on the brink of collapse. Um, I'm not actually joking about that. It's really problematic over there right now. Uh, being an IMG is in a disadvantage in the sense that uh, when you're applying for like these core training specialties and the the uh, the three years after that, I don't remember. What they take into account are things like publications, poster presentations, again, um, like how well are you liked? And usually in UK medical schools, they start um, like writing papers and doing posters and stuff while they're already in medical school. So I wrote that it's a disadvantage, not in the sense uh, like it is in the US, but in the sense that they already have a leg up from the very start, which you won't be. But again, if you don't want a competitive specialty, like it's it's kind of fine. The other things are, is that you can actually, uh, I don't know why I wrote UK here, but I meant Australia. You have a chance to go to Australia. So Australia is notoriously difficult to go to if you're not trained. They do not like training even their own doctors, but they consider the UK and Irish system as equivalent to theirs. So if you get your training done in the UK or Ireland, you can do a lateral to Australia quite easily. So I want to go to Ireland. I'm not going to say much about this because uh, you already got a very good overview of it. It's just like I wrote, you can't apply if you're not EU, but uh, sorry, it's very hard for me. To, okay. I said that you can't apply if you're not EU, which is not true. It's just very, 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 very difficult, uh, much more difficult. So Germany, uh, it works like you're applying for a regular job. So you need a CV. Uh, if you have contacts, that's even better because say, I don't know, uh, in this theoretical scenario, I want to do cardiology. If I know that I want to do cardiology and I do rotations there during the summer, I did Erasmus there, um, the people in the department know me, they know I want to apply. When I apply to that job with my CV, I, they already know me, they know my work ethic, they know my capabilities, they know how like interested and curious I am. And these give you a massive leg up. Um, other things that matter, again, is publications, conferences, they're not super strict about it, but these are just things that give you an advantage because again, it's kind of like applying um, for any regular job. The most qualified person is going to get it. Uh, yeah, so if you want something competitive and you speak German, this is a really, really good option. Um, they have really amazing pay uh, compared to most of Europe and they have great conditions like your maternity leave, paternity leave, sick leave, uh, they respect your hours, they respect your rights, which as a doctor is very rare, it turns out. Um, other things is you need to learn German. And again, the process takes very, very long. You need to get uh, all of your degrees recognized. You need to pass not only a German language exam, but you need to pass, uh, there's a special exam that they have, which is uh, like medical terms in German. Um, but also the other thing that I didn't write here is that a lot of these hospitals, uh, because again, they're so desperate for doctors, they have systems where they will pay you to go to that city and learn the language. And they pay for your accommodation and food and stuff while you're there to learn the language. Um, so Germany is a really, really good option if you're willing to learn German. Okay, so that leaves, should I stay in Italy? I know we said uh, like this presentation is meant to be about outside of Italy. But in my experience, now that I say I probably know about 50, minimum 50 graduates who um, like from my university, and you would be surprised at the number of them that decided to stay in Italy in the end. Uh, a lot of people, I actually know three people who also went to the UK for one year and they hated it. And so now they're coming back to sit the concourse of this year to start specialization. So the cons is uh, you need to be fluent in the language. Uh, luckily, if you graduated from an Italian university, you don't have to provide a certificate, but it is very, very important that you are fluent in Italian. Uh, <laughs> the pay isn't great. Uh, I think the the flat, what they give you is 1,550 or something like that. You don't pay tax on it, but, and this is the part that I was most shocked to find out, you have to pay fees to the university. So if your fees are currently, I don't know, 2,000 euro a year, you have to pay that to the university to be able to train. And that's why when people are estimating your salary, they reduce it by about 200 euro a month because you have to pay for the fees. Um, you also have to pay for your own insurance, which I think is like 400 a year. So the pay isn't great and you have to actually pay the university. Um, so it's so funny to me that they, you know, they're just taking back some of their own money. Um, and the hours vary greatly. So like if you're in a surgical specialty, uh, 
like I know a guy who is in orthopedics in Florence and he told me that there are some weeks that he's getting paid a uh, hundred euro. It's barely compensated the overtime. Once he told me that uh, he worked out his salary and he was getting paid, I think like two euro an hour and he cried about it. And, you know, but that's the realistic part of it. However, if you do, I don't know, say psychiatry or dermatology, you're going to get the same amount of pay for working 38 hours a week, which is the official uh, contract. Um, the standard of training is really, really different. So if you go to one hospital, you, you know, you never know what you're going to get. There's not really a, a standardized scheme compared to other countries. So the pros are is that it's a standardized exam and there is absolutely zero IMG discrimination. So you are just as likely to get into uh, cardiology as an Italian person. It is maximum, maximum, no matter what the specialty is, five years of training. So as long as you actually get in, you know that at the end of the five years, you're going to be a strutturato, which is uh, an attending. And things that you would classically consider competitive in other countries are not actually competitive here. Um, so neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, anesthesiology, not competitive at all, like at all, uh, which is super, super shocking. And another pro is that, uh, you know, I guess it can also be a con if, you know, you're sick of living here for a while, but you kind of already know the system. You're used to understanding how things work. Uh, you've probably immersed to a certain degree into the culture. So uh, now, after I've given this huge rant, um, the things that I think you guys should be asking yourselves is, am I willing to learn another language and become fluent in it? Because I know that a lot of people usually aim for uh, the UK or US because it's English speaking, but there are serious advantages to maybe gritting your teeth and learning another language. Do you want a competitive specialty? Because, for example, for me, I was never considering staying in Italy, but I decided I want anesthesiology, which in other countries is quite, quite competitive. So it might be easier just to stay here and suffer for an extra five years and then go to another country. Um, related again, spending years in the process, like do you want to spend 10 years to become a consultant in the UK? And does the country care if I'm EU or non-EU? So like we said it previously, Ireland still cares, Switzerland cares. If you're non-EU, there's not even a point in applying to Switzerland. So I think the most important thing is to kind of optimize your choice for uh, life satisfaction. I think a lot of people, especially when they're in their early 20s, and this is such an idealistic, you know, profession that they think that, you know, they need to grind and absolutely destroy themselves and get to the top. Um, it's to consider, like, if it's actually really worth going through all of these difficult um, years and processes just for prestige. I'm not accusing anyone of doing this. I'm just saying in general, it's very common to see in medicine that people tend to just want to do something because of the clout that comes with it. Um, but I can tell you that when you're 60 years old and you're 70 years old, you're not going to be looking back uh, saying, oh, I wish I worked harder. I wish I gave more of my hours, uh, more of my youth to this. So I think the most important thing that you should consider in your post-graduation is, do I want to break my back trying to get into something I'm not going to even enjoy versus uh, should I try to optimize for something that's going to make my life easier and happier? Um, so that's everything I had prepared. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's really interesting. Um, so, yeah, if anyone has any questions for Sarah um, or Richard or anyone, uh, Q&A is open. open yeah, for I'll handle the questions uh, for a yeah. moment. But before I start uh, with the questions, uh, since you mentioned something, Sarah, and uh, from my experience personally about getting informed about uh, training uh, recognition back home in my own country, um, the five year maximum training uh, duration um, can be a double edged sword because at least uh, back home, um, uh, the number of training years really matters. So if anyone is looking to changing countries and stuff, uh, give that a thought, especially that some countries also differentiate between the number of training uh, years uh, for the medical degree and then the training years for specialty. So there might be a certain threshold. So if anyone um, is in similar situation, uh, keep that in mind. Um, regarding the questions, we've got some questions from YouTube, yeah? 
uh, first of all, uh, during uh, specialty training, um, how possible is it to change country, for example, from Italy to the UK in terms of transfer and in terms of uh, starting from zero? So can you uh, clear this, those two aspects up for us? Uh, I mean, I've never really heard of transferring over. Uh, it's not like a medical school where you earn a certain number of credits and the credits let you skip years. Um, it doesn't really work like that for training as far as I know, but I have to admit that this is not something that I'm very familiar with. I know that, for example, if you do the foundation years in UK, you qualify to go over to Australia. Um, I don't know if that's like a, like I used the word transfer while I was doing the conference, but I don't know if I would uh, say that it's like a transfer in the literal sense that we use it for medical school. Um, I don't actually know if that's possible, but I wouldn't hold my breath about doing, I don't know, two years of anesthesiology here and then expecting a spot um, of for anesthesiology in the UK, considering how many years extra they would have done and how much harder it is to get in. Um, so I'm not very knowledgeable about the topic. Like, I don't want to say something that's incorrect, but I wouldn't hold my <laughs> breath that that's a realistic thing that can be done. One more question uh, regarding uh, Germany, for example, uh, do the Tirocini abilitante matter? And if someone graduates without them, uh, does it put them uh, at a disadvantage? So for Germany, I'm not certain, um, but I can send uh, a link. There's a subreddit for medical school in the EU, and they have a very, very, very detailed write-up about uh, doing residency in Germany because it seems to be one of the most popular options. Um, so you can check from there. But since it's like applying for a job, uh, <laughs> if I had an applicant in front of me who wanted to work in my specialty and then they told me that they don't even have 100 hours of experience throughout medical school, you know, like that might be a consideration. So is it an official requirement or not? The fact that you're applying to it as if it's a job, if you can't even show that you've done the bare minimum to graduate from your school, it might not be a good luck. But again, I don't want to pull anything, like I don't want to say anything that's false. I think logically this is what makes sense. I'll send the uh, the subreddit uh, guide because they have a very, very detailed um, write-up on how to apply to Germany. Sure, and I personally do recommend the subreddit. I've been all over it for uh, for the last year, and uh, they got some surprisingly good resources. So I personally also recommend it. Um, something else um, regarding the recognition of uh, specialty training in Italy and then transferring to Ireland. So let's say you specialize in Italy and then you want to move back to Ireland, or someone else wants to move to Ireland or to the UK. Um, for people who are uh, um, familiar with the US system, that's very problematic, but uh, what about the UK and Ireland in terms of getting your specialty training recognized back there? Okay, so this is actually, <coughs> sorry, this is currently what I'm looking into. Um, it seems it's a lot easier to get it recognized. Uh, and I say this because at the moment, there's a huge shortage of doctors all over the world, but what's even bigger shortage is the fact that there aren't enough trained doctors. Um, so I actually consulted with someone and there are actually companies in Ireland that do it as well. And they see, it seems to me again, because I haven't gone through the process yet, that if you are specialty trained, um, what usually happens is there will be a period where you are shadowed to make sure that you're competent. Um, but they like recognize your training as long as you can prove it. I don't know what the process is. I don't know if you get a diploma at the end of your specialty training, but they have a way of um, like recognizing it. And after that, you have to go through like a brief period to prove your competence. And after that, it's again, like just applying for a job as if you're an attending or if you're a consultant. Um, so I like, I kind of started looking into it, but then it kind of felt like learning how to run before I'm even walking. Like I haven't even started the specialty training and, you know, figuring out the entire process step by step. It's not something I've done yet. But from the preliminary research I've done to it, it is a um, it is a possibility, especially if you did the specialization in Italy uh, regarding going to Ireland. 
Okay, I see. Um, the next question is uh, is regarding the UK residency, and uh, how important is uh, the GPA uh, regarding uh, your chances to get into a UK residency training program? Okay, again, there's changing the system. Uh, in the past, it was the most important thing. Not so much your average, but how you compared to the other people uh, in your class. So, I mean, if everyone's GPA was low in your class and yours was fine, um, because again, like it's not, there's no like threshold. It's not like, oh, if it's, you know, 28, then you get to go anywhere. It's not, it's your relative position compared to your other classmates. And actually what matters even more is the number of credits you have. So if your average is 30, but you're missing most of the credits, it doesn't matter if you have the highest average, because again, it's based on a decile ranking against uh, your classmates. Um, when it comes to getting a spot, it's like I said, you're basically guaranteed a spot. Like if you apply, if you do the SJT, if you did the PLAB and you did your ranking, you did the whole process, you did your IELTS, uh, IELTS, whatever, you're guaranteed a spot. Will it be in a good hospital? Will it be in things that you want? Will it be? That's another question. Um, but in general, it's not your GPA that matters. It's how you rank against the others. But again, the UK MLA might change that. Um, you need to wait and see because we don't know how it's going to change it right now. Okay, okay. And uh, since you you mentioned that uh, the number of credits, um, do you mean the number of credits you have by the end of each each academic year or the number of credits by the time you get this report from the dean or um, what not? Like, what do you, exactly do you mean the number of credits? Because I also remember uh, Leanne mentioned something to me uh, some while ago. Uh, regarding um, like leaving exams until the next academic year. So maybe if you think that's worth talking about, I think uh, a couple of minutes would do. Sure. So the formula, the exact formula that they use is a little bit of a secret. Um, and we've tried to find out quite a few number of times because, for example, uh, I know 40 Corso people who have applied for it. And so they've tried to ask, is my class ranking against my original class that I applied with? Is it according to this year's fifth years? Is it according to only people who are applying to the UK? We don't know. They have basically told us they do not want to tell us, but it seems, uh, as far as I know, that it's a special formula that the UK sends to the university and they have to use this formula to determine what the decile is. The only thing that we do know is that the number of exams you have matters. So in the situation, let's say best case scenario, you are compared to only the people who are actually applying that year. So say you're in fifth year, uh, it's the end of fifth year and you're applying for it, but you, or you still have two exams from fifth year left, right? Compared to someone who has done all of their first to fifth year exams, they have more credits than you, they're gonna rank higher than you. It doesn't matter if your average is higher. Now, again, because they don't exactly tell us uh, we don't know if, for example, a sixth year who is deciding to apply late, but they have all of their first to sixth year credits done. Um, do, do they rank higher or they don't? We don't know because they refuse to tell us things. But what has happened, uh, I know a girl who applied two years in a row. The first year, she couldn't make the graduation date and her rank actually lowered from the first time she applied to the second time she applied. So that makes us think that they compare you to the class that you enrolled with. So maybe if more people graduated because they would have more credits, it's a bit of a mess. But like what I can tell you is the more exams you have, the more on time you are, it's going to count as higher. Uh, and it's more important than a high average compared to having like 10 exams missing, for example. I don't know if that, I hope that clarified it a bit. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for that. So um, more questions from YouTube. Uh, how, how, on average, how long are the processes of specialization after uh, graduating and going to Germany? Uh, going to Germany, I wouldn't be able to tell you, uh, but you need, you need to check the subreddit because the thing is, like, I know a little bit about everywhere, but I don't know the exact details. But as far as I know, um, Again, I don't want to speak too much about it, but it is kind of like you apply for it as a job, you get in, you start. I can't imagine it being longer than six years, but I don't want to give you any false information. The subreddit will have like a really, really good guide on it. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, what else? 
someone's asking, I give the exact uh, wording, how easy or hard it is uh, to have a lateral move within Europe after specialization residency. So as an attending, how easy it is to get your training recognized within uh, European countries, uh, if that's what the Nicholas means. Yeah, again, it really depends country to country. But what I can tell you is that if you're a qualified doctor, it's way easier to get a job compared to if you're asking a country to train you. Um, okay. That's just a general rule of thumb. But like you can't really apply a standard to all of Europe because one doesn't exist. Like we don't even have a standard that exists for medical schools or specialty training. Um, I know someone who they finished their uh, residency in Germany and wanted to go back to their country in Portugal. Uh, they did plastic surgery. And once they got back to Portugal, something in their specialty, uh, I think it was like um, they don't cover like feet surgery or hand reconstruction surgery. It was something really like thing. So they had to redo that part of their training, which was about six months. But then they were able to work as an attending in plastic surgery afterwards. So it really, really depends. Like a lateral system, like as easy to transfer as if it's between medical schools, I don't think something like that exists, but I can tell you that if you have European training, you have your European specialty done, your options are like infinitely more uh, compared to if you're asking that country to train you. So I don't know if a one-to-one -one system exists, but I would be confident to say that your life is going to be 20 times easier. I see, I see. And uh, someone's asking about Switzerland. I think you mentioned that non-European students uh, cannot go there, but someone's asking, uh, even if the non-European students who have graduated from Italy, is this also like a blocked path for them? There's no chance for them to apply to yeah, residency it's, program? No, it's it's impossible because uh, Switzerland has this thing. Um, it's like almost, it, it's like an employment law where the only time they can give a job uh, is if no other EU citizen applied to it. Um, they have like, this kind of like legal agreement that any sort of job posting, uh, it has to be EU first. I think someone was trying to explain it to me while they were going to Switzerland. Unfortunately, if you're non-EU, I mean, listen, if you're willing to go to the headache, I'm of the opinion that it never hurts to apply. But I know that Switzerland and Ireland are the two countries that are very, very strict about uh, being non-EU versus EU, despite having an EU degree. Okay, I see, I see. Um, moving on. Um, I um, I just have a quick question from someone. Um, someone's asking just if you would have any information on specialty in France, just in general, just because uh, we noticed it wasn't mentioned, but like if there's any information there or... Yeah, so I know a guy who's going through it right now. Um, you need to have a C2, not a C1. A, uh, I don't think this is true because I remember when I was looking at it for it to count it, you need to have completed a minimum of 1000 verified hours. If you don't meet this threshold, then it doesn't count. And it's the same for the foundation year, um, for the foundation year programs. So the threshold is 1000 hours, not 300. Uh, I do know that uh, in the last few years, at least for people from my university, they allow them to graduate. Like you still have to do the Tirocinio hours to be able to graduate, but they gave them the option to uh, <laughs> graduate without the certificate, the abilitante. And uh, this turned out to be a disaster because not doing the abilitante just basically means that you, like, you don't really have the appropriate things to get a license. Uh, and the cutoff threshold is a thousand hours. So, Again, I think it's really worth always checking for yourself and verifying it for yourself. But uh, there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't do <laughs> these 300 hours. Like, I I don't know. It's also possible because Richie did the thing five years ago. Uh, so he started five years ago. So maybe this is a recent thing that they've brought in in the last five years, uh, that the threshold is 1,000 hours, not 300. So. Okay, and I think it's worth mentioning uh, when you speak about the training hours, only the abilitante count because, again, uh, the, um, like a couple of months ago, I was inquiring about uh, getting my degree recognized back home. I was counting also the total training hours, so total clerkship hours, and I think they came down to around 1,300, so those don't count, only the abilitante count. 
Yeah, because usually the abilitante, like because it needs to be stamped and certified for every single hour that you do. Um, like, for example, I just I just received my booklet today. Like it's probably be similar to you, but you have to fill out like literally every single hour you do and what you did in those hours and they need to be signed. And at the end, it has to get stamped. So this is how it works for uh, the TPDS. Uh, every single hour you do is completely verified. So I don't know, like maybe in your home country, because otherwise it would be impossible to certify how many hours of training someone did. Like I, I can say I did 800 hours. How am I going to prove that realistically? At least with these booklets, and I'm sure it's going to be a similar system in your guys, but this is for Sapienza. These are verified, certified, stamped hours that I've completed as a bare minimum. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, next, uh, someone's asking if they finish without knowing German language, um, how do they reach out to have a spot to learn the language and have a spot at the hospital afterwards? After that, like, I think they're referring to the programs or opportunities you mentioned that you will get paid to learn the language and then you will be so on some sort of placement after that. So um, how does that work? Uh, again, if you look at the subreddits and if you just Google it, like 100% you will find results. It's not like this like secret, uh, only if you're in medical school, you get to find out they're doing active recruitment, they're advertising it, they're very desperate to get people. Um, I know someone who wasn't even applying there, but just wanted a summer in Germany. And last summer, she just went to Germany for three months to learn the language and got her food and accommodation paid for. So I know that it's a very real possibility. Um, but I don't have a direct source to give you because, again, it's never a route that I personally wanted to pursue. But I am 100 percent certain if you go to the subreddit and you Google it, um, you'll be able to find whatever you need to. OK, OK. And um, last question from YouTube. Um, I know like we've said that they, cha they are quite some changes in the UK and it's still a mess to figure it, or figure it out, but I think it's worth uh, delivering the question. Uh, he's asking, uh, how do we get into the foundation foundation years one and two in the UK after getting done with medical school and submitting your uh, P-labs and uh, your documents from here? One second, I actually have a... Mm. Because I, I I just recently interviewed someone uh, about going to the foundation years and I had I don't know where I put my notes because um, I didn't think I would be talking about the UK that much because I thought Richie was going to cover it. Um, but essentially the way it works, you apply through a system called Oracle and this is like a, a hub basically where you're going to do everything. Um, you like upload everything that you need to, you do this, you know, you do your GMC cert uh, registration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you've done all of this stuff. What you then do is you rank the regions of England. I am not familiar with uh, England, but let's say it's like Scotland, Wales, some other part in England, some other part. I think there's like 18 or 20 in total. You put your preferences down. So say you really want to go to London, wherever London is, you put that as your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, your fourth choice, whatever, whatever, whatever. OK, then based on. Uh, the point, the number of points you get with the SJT, your ranking, your PLAB, you know, et cetera, the thing I was explaining earlier, how you rank compared to your classmates, you get a certain number of points. If you're at the highest uh, of those points, you get your first choice. You get that deanery. So you get wherever London is in England. I don't know. You get that. After that, uh, you are then compared to everyone who got uh, the London area as their first choice. OK, so anyone else who had put London as their first choice are now removed unless they actually got it. You are now compared to the rest of them. So let's say your points are super, super high again. You get your first choice hospital. So I don't know, say like St. Bart's or whatever. It's the only hospital I know there. Um, if your points are high enough, then you get St. Bart's. And then <laughs> the six rotations you want to do, you rank them again. And again, it's based on how you rank compared to other people. This is how it worked up until this year. Uh, I don't know how things are going to change. Maybe like UKMLA is going to become like USMLE, where based on your score, and it's going to be like the IMAT, you know, you just do the IMAT, you put the ranking of the universities that you want, and it's going to be like that. It's really hard to tell. But at least in the past, this is how it worked. 
Okay, perfect. So we need to see what the new updates are to know everything. Um, on my end from YouTube, I think the questions are over. Um, there are two people who would like to ask. Uh, first, we have uh, Yasamin. If you would like to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, I have some questions. Is there any country spe specifically like England um, that ca uh, cares about age? It's like age is, um, is also a, like, I mean, real different age. I mean, for example, like I will be graduated by, by when I am 40 around ish. Um, so is it, was it, would it be any disadvantages or like this like no age uh, consideration i mean it would be very hard to prove a bias that exists um mm -hmm. like for example like i'm just making up the situation say it's a country where it's interview based like germany and you want to go for neurosurgery which has like 100 hour work weeks you know a surgery on average is like 15 hours maybe when they're considering it they might not be like oh how is a 40 year old going to keep up with this uh work yeah right yeah. like that is the only way I could possibly think of that age you would be discriminated against based on your age but that okay. would one be very incredibly difficult to prove and two a country that uh, is interview based like say like Sweden blah 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 usually they're more reasonable with their rights mm -hmm. and things like that um so I can't imagine anywhere would actually have your age as a consideration it's that's the only <laughs> scenario that I could think of that it would yeah. apply but again that would be very very difficult and i don't think it would really be a thing oh thank you i have one more question um more questions uh you said in england uh probably having a diff a, another degree will be a plus and would it be like um consider if if the degree has been taken in in england itself for example like if you have a master degree already done in uk would it be um like more points like no, it's plus. it's like the the way it works is basically like check boxes. So <clears throat> the score you get while you're ranking your things, a part of the score comes from the SJT, like I don't know, 50 points, let's say. And then okay. uh, based on your D style, you get a certain number of points. Like I, I'm making up the points here, but let's say you're in the top 10 mm -hmm. percent D style, you get 50 points versus if you're in the bottom 10 where you get 10 okay. points. Um, then uh, after that, I think like, a master's gives you like one point or two points and a PhD gives you one point or two points. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like checking a box. It's not like, oh, it was in neuroscience from the UK. They don't care okay. about that. It's just yeah. checking a box. Yeah. And Again, system changing. So keep that yeah, in mind. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. might not be relevant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how competitive is psychiatry in England? Do you have any idea? It's not at all. It's it's actually what most IMGs go for because GP, psychiatry, emergency medicine, these three generally holds true in every single country. Uh, the only country where I have seen this rule be broken is in Turkey, where psychiatry is one of the most competitive specialties. Um, <laughs> psychiatry, <laughs> emergency medicine, and what's the other one? Uh, GP. These are usually not competitive at all for anyone. Okay. That and um, one more thing, uh, I think it's going to be my last question. You said um, probably like having uh, publications, like or helping or whatever, will help in getting into England, for example. Um, but uh, do, does it have to be related to the um, specialty we want to do, or it can be in any area? It's gonna have the point. So it depends because when you're doing the foundation year application, it's the same as having a degree. It's just checking a box and it's only up to a certain number of publications. It's not like you can just cheat yourself into having 30 publications and you get a magic 30, you know, yeah. uh, it's up to a certain degree. But even Rishi was saying during his presentation that while you're doing your internship years and, you know, your um, EST or whatever it's called, um, you know, you still have to do conferences. You still have to do uh, poster present uh, publication. Uh, poster uh, presentations yeah. and you have to yeah. do publications because it does become like applying to a job so if you want to apply to psychiatry but all of your 
presentations, your publications, your posters, if it's all in, I don't know, um, podiatry, for example, uh, you know, they're, yes, you're not as likely to be compared to someone who has like a hundred projects under their belt in psychiatry. Okay. I'm just like giving very rough examples here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the foundation year part, it doesn't matter. Checking a box. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. Okay, there's also now uh, Radwan. Radwan, if you'd like to unmute yourself and if you have a question, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, for the UK, we need to provide, for the uh, foundation program, we need to provide an English language proficiency, either IELTS or OET. I read about a third way of submitting Dean's statement where the Dean uh, says that like your degree was in English and you, more than 75% of your exams and uh, etc. was in English. If can, is that acceptable to attend the foundation program or is it not acceptable if you're graduating from Italy? I can tell you right now that uh, in the last 10 years that my university has existed and has not an English program, I think we're now on our fifth year of having graduating students. Uh, every single one of them has had to do the IELTS. And it's to the degree that if you are from the UK, you were born in the UK, you did all of your schooling in the UK, every single year of it, your course was in the, uh, is in English, you still have to do the IELTS. So if you want to risk getting a Dean's letter and hoping that that's accepted, uh, that's up to you. But I can tell you right now that I know people who were born and raised in the UK and did all of their schooling in the UK and they still had to do the IELTS. So. Thank you. Um, okay, I mean, if no one else has um, any other questions or anything else to say, um, I suppose big thank you to um, our two speakers. So um, thank you to uh, Richard and Sarah. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, and for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining. And um, there will be a feedback form, I believe. Um, so yeah, big thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. I think the feedback form should be available available on the uh, chat right now. So if you can go in and fill it, uh, we would really appreciate it. And it will benefit us for future events. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, and thank for you. all um, resources mentioned, so um, uh, the HSE um, Irish resources that Richard shared and also um, any subreddits or any useful resources that um, our speakers mentioned, we will we will for forward them all on to students um, possibly in the in the EMSA WhatsApp group chat or something. Um, so yeah, big thank you to everyone. Thank you.